Okay, back to real life, and I, I promise I won't suicide. Uh, so they didn't change from yesterday. These are the guidelines on the front page, and you see it's a multidisciplinary guideline. So if we monitor, we monitor what for? We monitor first to check for side effects, because we believe, we all believe, and it makes sense, that the earlier we treat the side effect, the better the outcome will be in terms of quality of life. This is probably evidence-based. We also check for efficacy, that means for relapse, because we believe also, and it's not so clear, but let's say it's clear, that if we change an ineffective treatment early, we might have some results in the second line treatment. So that's what we are monitoring. And I will start with a very basic treatment, a follow-up after local treatment, just to redefine what we're talking about. Following surgery, standard of relapse is PSA progression above 0.2 and increasing, meaning two PSA rising. This has been recently challenged, and I will not discuss that, but that's standard so far. Following radiotherapy, again, same standard. It's nadir plus two, whatever the nadir is, that's standard, and that's true with or without ADT. I highlight that because the relapse might be associated with METS, meaning advanced disease, but we also know that the relapse is very heterogeneous. And it's based on many factors, the initial disease, the Gleason, initial Gleason score, the initial uh, T stage or PT stage, but on top of all that, probably PSA doubling time is a key driver of prognostic. Timing of relapse has been said that it's an early relapse, you might have a systemic disease, even if some, sometimes in some papers it's a little bit Con there's some conflicts in terms of results. So salvage treatment must be individualized and based on very low level of evidence on, on the very old fashioned bone scan and CT scan, which is standard. We have to individualize that also based on PSA doubling time. And you know the highest risk of subsequent METs. Again, the key driver is a PSA doubling time. So you have a relapse. You believe it might be METs. When do you image? Probably the key, the key message is on the first line there. Only image if it's clearly changed your practice. If it's just to have nice pictures, just take a photo. That's as useful and less expensive. So clearly only image if it's changed practice. And based on the evidence, Probably if you recur after radical prostatectomy and the PSA is below one, no imaging at all is needed. I don't recommend PS PSMA so far because the evidence is still lacking. Probably you should perform a bone and a CT scan only if the patient has the highest risk of METs mean, and the highest chance to see something. If you have a PSA doubling time of three months and a PSA below two, don't do any imaging, probably you won't, you won't see anything. So when you have a high PSA or very, a very rapidly growing PSA with a PSA at least of two nanograms per ml, probably should be the minimal level of PSA, evidence-based again. After radiotherapy, exactly the, same, exactly the same thing, but on top of that, perform a multiparentary prostate MRI only if you believe the patient is a potential candidate for salvage local. If not, probably it's a waste of money and a waste of time. And then if you perform a local MRI after radiotherapy, one of the key findings with the MRIs is to target the repeated biopsy. They are mandatory before considering any local salvage after radiotherapy. Later on, you check the testosterone, the follow-up during testosterone. The clear message, also I'm not sure it's done in practice, is check the testosterone level. For sure, you need to check when the patient is progressing. That's part of the definition of MCRPC. But probably you should also check, be checking the testosterone during castration treatment. And the, and the level you have to reach 
we are facing a problem, and it's a real problem. EMA and FDA request a testosterone below 50. All the drugs are supposed to lower the testosterone in the same manner as surgical castration. When you remove the balls, the testosterone level is below 20. So if you want to do the same thing, you should have a testosterone below 20. No discussion on that. So the clear advice is check the testosterone level on a repeated basis. Why? Because probably testosterone under treatment matters. This is the best evidence we have so far that when you are castrate sensitive, the lower the testosterone, the better the outcome. It's a retrospective analysis of the continuous arm of the PR7 study. It was a continuous versus intermittent treatment in patients relapsing after radiotherapy. The key question of this analysis was time to castrate resistant. And you clearly see that if you have a continuous testosterone level below 0.7, that is below 20, the time to castrate resistant was not reached after seven years of follow-up. While it was six years when the testosterone level was be between 0.7 and 1.7, and it was only four years when at some time it was above 1.7 and 1.7 is 50 nanograms per ml. So we clearly suggested the guideline that you should check the testosterone and you should do your best to have a testosterone as low as possible. You must also follow the patient and all the side effects of the castration. You have all the list. There are all the side effects of the castration, but there are also all the side effects of the disease itself such as voiding problem and kidney problems. So the clinic must include a DRE, probably avoiding analysis, IPSS plus post-body residual urine. It's very basic. We are far from the new fancy imaging modality of drugs, but it should be done. And I must say I'm not so convinced from what I see in my country or at least in my department with the juniors that it's done every time. It's the only way to, pre to prevent devastating side effects or devastating clinical progression. Bone follow-up, probably the key message is check the bone health initially. Two very simple things, the FRAX, the FRAX score, it's online, it's for free, it doesn't cost anything and it gives you a very strong predictor risk of further bone problems. If you are at risk, probably a DEXA is very wise to be done. Check the calcium level, check the vitamin D, and it should be repeated if the patient is at risk. Osteoporosis exists, you will induce osteoporosis. Osteoporosis may break the bones and might lead to side effects. Remember, if a man breaks his hip from osteoporosis, he has twice the risk to die from the, from the broken bone compared to women with osteoporosis. And the biology, probably every six months outside PSA, you should check the testosterone also and the, all the things that are linked to side effect of castration. Nothing special. I'm sure all of you are doing all that. MCRPC, there's a very clear definition. First of all, and Karim clearly said that, check the testosterone, it belongs to the definition. I just want you to know that it's either a PSA progression with a PSA above two and rising, or a, a, an imaging progression based on bone scan progression, which is a number of hotspots and not a hotspot that is darker than it was previously or disease progression using resist criteria, that's clear. I just want to highlight something, be very careful about only symptomatic progression. Painful bone might be secondary to osteoporotic fracture. Be very careful about that. Painful does not equal progression, not always. If you are facing an M0 CRPC, what do we do? The evidence is almost close to zero. 
we have almost nothing. So the level of evidence is very weak and the grade of recommendation is a, only a grade C, meaning consensus. So you might absolutely disagree on that. And the suggestion was to check in asymptomatic patients when the PSA is above two, then check when the PSA is above five, one, why five and not four or six, because we decided to go for five, and then every doubling PSA. Again, the evidence to support that is equal to zero. But you cannot perform a bone and a CT scan every three months. It's a total nonsense. And you probably you shouldn't wait until you have symptoms. Of course, if the patient becomes symptomatic, you have to check with imaging modalities. There's no discussion about that. Monitoring during MCRPC patients, it's quite simple, quite obvious, but not so easy. First thing, check the patient's treatment compliance. You know there are some rules with some drugs that have been that are not to be taken in the morning or in the afternoon, but between two meals, and if not, you might face problems. So check treatment compliance. We always believe the patients are very compliant with our treatment. It is known that it's not the case. Check treatment complications. You know all that. The clinical complications are very easy to recognize, provided you pay attention to what the patient is telling you but also de to detect side effects. I will not go in detail about the, how to check the treatment with AB, the treatment with ENSA, the treatment with docetaxel. Everyone knows that. Never forget, it's not because you take a pill that you don't need to check what's ongoing, especially regarding the liver. And you must also check the clinical efficacy and then we are facing a problem. All the literature we have, all the data we have, to decide that the treatment is effective or ineffective is based on the very old-fashioned image modality based on bone scan and CT scan. That should be standard of imaging. If you want to go there with a very fancy imaging, which I'm quite sure will totally change the way we're treating patients, you will use whole body MRI, absolutely perfect. But then you will be facing a real problem. And again, I'm talking from guidelines perspective. In MRI, you will see lesions that will be growing and lesions that will be shrinking. What the overall result of that? If you have that in combination with a bone scan and CT scan, this was never considered to change a treatment. If you check the patient on imaging, it's because you want to know if the treatment is active or inactive. So if you use multi-parametric MRI, absolutely fine, probably a lot of very important information, but in practice, we still don't know what to do with the results we have. So the guidelines suggest to go for bone scan and CT scan only, as long as we don't have clear signals how to interpret the discordant progression. And when to do it, again, consensus finding. Probably, if the patient is asymptomatic, do it every, three, every six months and do it for the first time after two or three months to, to be sure that it's not, there is at least no progression. Why this and why every six months? Because the consensus was around six months. Don't do it every month, but do it because you might have a very stable PSA, a very asymptomatic patient but still a progressing disease. And on top of that, you must consider the overall well-being of the patient. And probably as long as the patient is in good health, totally asymptomatic, good health in this situation, probably this is the priority. And you should only consider switching if there's a clear progression. And again, based on what is available, the progression should be defined by at least two criteria, a PSA progression plus a bone scan progression or a CT progression or a quality of life deterioration or symptom progression. I want to highlight 
very strongly that PSA progression alone is never a reason to switch a treatment. That's it. <laughs>